Hello and welcome to SEO 101 on WMR.FM, episode number 456. Today is chapter 3 of the SEO 101 learning series. Uh, it's exciting. Today's on-site basics. So we're going to get into what it takes to actually optimize your pages. Uh, to really kick things off, because we got an information-dense uh, episode here, we're going to go dig right in. We're going to keep our anecdotes low. Um, and, uh, take notes <laughs> for you. I hope you, hope you take some notes anyway. So first of all, an anatomy of a web page. Let's start with what's in the code because there's one part that is important, even though you don't want to think about code probably because you're not really into this stuff, but, uh, in the actual code of a web page, there's the head and it's got a bracket on either side, those uh, arrow brackets on either side of it. And this is where we put in the title tag, the meta description, open graph tags, which is the schema markup and such, uh, Google Analytics code, any other kind of uh, tracking codes put in there as well. It's really important, and it's something that uh, if you really get deeper into SEO, you will be paying attention to, but uh, on a, a higher level. At this stage, though, um, you'll... You might have to jump in there a bit, at least for things such as the title tag and meta tag and uh, description, the meta tag such as description and, and uh, uh, well, I was going to say keyword tag, but that's that's too old now. Uh, <laughs> so you don't even use that anymore. Well, I should say that. It is used, but it's only used in, in systems. It's not used for search. So you can completely ignore it. Um, but we're going to get into how those are structured and some of the best practices in a minute. On the rest of the page, we're looking at the visual header. This is what you see when you go to a page. The header is where you see the title of the page and who it's, you know, uh, where the navigation is. Um, any kind of imagery like that. It's usually the foundation of the design. That's what you're going to see from page to page as you go through the website. Then you see the body. The body is the bulk of the content. This is where, uh, the information that is relevant to that page that you visited shows up. Uh, there's usually, uh, so maybe it's a subtitle in there and then there's imagery and text, and video and who name. It could be very, it could be very small, it could be very long. It is the body. It's really the substance of the page. Finally, we have the visual footer. This is where you have again, like the top, uh, like the header, there's, uh, like a visual header, I should say, there's templated content for navigation typically. It doesn't have to be there, but sometimes there's some footer navigation. Address, contact information, contact information, maybe a map, social links, that kind of thing. Uh, that's really the substance of a web page. I know you can sure dig into a lot deeper, but that's really all you really need to know. Because we will be talking about the header, body, and footer. Um, we'll just, we won't say visual every time. We're just going to say header, body, footer. And if we talk about the code, we'll just say the head. Uh, the, the head of the code. Okay, we'll, we'll try and be really clear about that when we get to it. Now, service area pages. If you have a location-based business, it's really important that you have pages that are don't, devoted to your multiple locations, assuming you have those. Now, um, Scott, when we've created those before, um, what are the, what's the substance of those pages? Now, we don't have to get too in-depth here, but what what would make those pages different than other pages? Yeah, so the service area pages are usually, I mean, really, again, it depends, but often there'll be a map that shows either the area that's serviced or the, um, well, yeah, like the, a local area map, essentially. Um, you want to have information that's specific to that region that you're servicing. Um, anything to try to make it unique, because if you're servicing, say, two different cities or two areas within the same city, you don't just want to put up a page for every single one, like, Victoria is a great example because Victoria could just be Victoria or it could be Victoria, Sandwich, Oak Bay, Esquimalt, Langford. You know, there's all these different regions and you don't necessarily want to page for each of them unless you can help make it uh, unique in some way. So, you know, if you have different uh, staff that services different areas, you might want to talk about that staff that uh, the customers might see. Um, so that's sort of the gist, making unique, content-specific, relevant to the area that you serve. Yeah, I would think of it, uh, someone like a pizza place. If you had a pizza place, you would have them in little communities nearby, um, maybe multiple locations. And then it makes sense to perhaps have a service area page for each of those areas. 
But if you have uh, uh, maybe you're an HVAC company, you do you know, air conditioning and stuff, and you had one location, but you wanted to attack those little communities, or you wanted to get some better rankings in those, creating service area pages for that, that might be a bit much. Um, it could happen. I'm not saying it, it wouldn't. But um, you know, typically, you would just ex- do a great job of your existing location as, uh, and then mention that you're also a service area business. It is, just, it is a, a science unto itself, uh, location-based SEO. Uh, don't, yes, there is a component of this actual learning series where we'll get deeper into it. But service area pages are important if you want to tackle areas uh, that perhaps you don't have great exposure in. And the page is, denied, is, is, is dedicated to almost creating a new home page for people who are looking for service in that area. The next is the author pages. This is your essentially like a writer bio, but these are about me. Often you have an about me page on your site. Uh, these are important because uh, whenever you create content online, you want to reference that using schema. And we can get into a little bit of that later. But you could also just look in, up into author schema and such. But the idea here is that you always point people back to or point the reference. I should say words. <laughs> you want to reference your author page or your bio from content you write on other sites or other pages on your own website. That way, Google always knows where to go. Uh, their search engines know where to go when they want to check how much experience um uh, an authority you have so that they can trust the content. Uh, there is a, another, as with anything we're talking about today, there's another level of complexity to that. But at the very least, you want to ensure that these author pages are created. Uh, your bio, if it's just a single site for a single person, your bio is well written, has some of your credentials on it. It has um, awards won, uh, perhaps you can be interviewed on different places. You'd have those there. Links to really key work that you've done saying, this is me. This is me. I did this. Google will then connect the dots. You have much more authority. Anyway, it's very important to have this. And if you have multiple writers on your site, make sure each one of them has those. Uh, it's going to be, uh, it's going to pay us, pay us weight in gold. All that work you're going to do. I, I will tell you a quick, before we go, okay. I was going to say real quick on that, that um, even if you don't have a blog and you aren't officially a writer, even if you just own the business and you're like Ross said, an about us page and you've got your key staff members or CEO, whatever, and you have an about page for them, even if you don't have content that you write, you should still have this page with all the, the aforementioned facts and links and things. Yeah. You would not want to have one with everyone's on it. You want to know individual pages for each one. Right. So maybe he has a picture of everyone, of each person, who they are, and you can click on that and go to a page that has their content, if that is relevant to you. Um, it all depends. Uh, a lot. <laughs> it's our favorite phrase in, 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 in yeah. search, and that's it. It depends. Take a shot. All right. So I did a lot of, did a lot of talking at the beginning here because I knew that Scott was going to be getting into some of this other stuff because he does a lot of the on-page stuff, being your senior, our senior SEO. So let's get into the title tag. So, Scott, what is it? Yeah, so the title tag, it shows up in the code in the head section of your page. Um, so you don't really see that when you look at the site, although you do see the text in the title tag appear in your browser tab. So if you get your tab in, you know, Chrome, Firefox, whatever, the text you see there is the title tag. And Google looks at that title tag, and it does have an influence on your rankings still. Um, not as much as it used to. It used to be you throw a keyword at the start of that tag, and you'd rank for it, but it's a bit more than that now. So that title tag, every single page has to have one. If you don't have one, most tools will throw an error at you, um, and you're going to be less likely to rank. So you definitely want to make sure you have one on every single page of your site. Every single page, the on every single page, the title should be unique. It should not be duplicated across multiple pages. Um, clearly, it should be relevant. Um, I know that sounds kind of, redundant. I shouldn't have to say it, but I see a lot of sites where the title tag is hold or, um, oh. you know, click. I've seen click here as a title tag. Like, what's that? So make sure it's relevant. Target keyword near the start, typically a bit of information near the middle and uh, often branding near the end. Uh, so, you know, but the most important stuff near the start, 
The length of the title tag, there's a lot of debate between how long a title tag should be. And this is changing all the time. Currently, on average, somewhere between the 30 to 60 character mark is is what you're going for. Although, we have seen recently that longer title tags are performing well. So, if you have something that's 65 characters, 70, 80, even 90, 100 characters, the stuff near the end of that title tag will not be visible to people who do a search. Google does truncate them in search results, but there is some evidence that that text can still help you rank. So don't get hung up too much on ranking, or sorry, on, um, yeah, do get hung up on ranking. Don't get hung up too much on the length of the title tag. Just, but, you know, try to keep it under 60 if you can, 60 characters. And uh, that's what people will see. Uh, and certainly don't stuff it. Keep your title tag, like don't, have a keyword dash keyword dash keyword dash keyword. Um, again, that used to work, but um, I don't know that it does anymore because we don't do it. It's not a good idea. So you know, don't stuff it. Keep it nice and clean. Um, as far as examples go, you know, you might have, um, uh, let's say you're a real estate agent. You might have uh, the start of the tag might be Victoria Real Estate Listings. Luxury homes for sale in Victoria, or then with a hyphen or maybe a, a vertical bar or some kind of delimiter. De, delimiter? De, oh my, yeah, but delimiter. I, I'm losing my words today too. I know. <laughs> and, and then, and then have a, we're in good company. Uh, some sort of delimiter there and say maybe luxury homes for sale in Victoria and then Ross's real estate, you know, or, or some kind of branding after that. That's sort of our standard is breaking it up into three sections. That would be a long. That's more, way more than 60 yeah. characters. But you can do that now, so that's true. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so maybe that's not the best example. I, I should have written one and prepared one in advance. Um, I'm not the best at coming up with stuff on the fly. Yeah, sorry, I threw that out yet. I don't know where uh, yeah. our notes here, but um, I just thought it might be helpful for them to see that how it might sound if, if they were to read it off. But the key is, again, making sure that the most important information is at the start of the tag is what shows up. And the first thing that shows up also in the visual tab on your browser. And uh, that might help people find your page if they've got a lot of tabs open, which I've seen ridiculous amounts of tabs open at times. Uh, so that's a, that's a thing to keep in mind um, along with the other information. And again, you don't have to worry so much about the length. It's just what's visible is what you want to keep in mind. I, I will add that, so the title tag really should be a very concise summary about what the page is, not necessarily a sentence about the page, yeah. because that's where the meta description tag comes in. So the title tag, you want keywords, you want it to be concise, and that's basically what you're going for. Uh, with the meta description tag, which we'll get into right now, uh, people will often see the meta description in the search results. So when they do a search, typically what you see is the title tag followed by the meta description, followed by, you know, the URL or any little added uh, uh, rich results that Google decides to add on that particular search. But the description tag is often used, although not always. Google, actually with your title tag, Google won't always use it, but often they will. So the description tag is where you have more play. You can um, use up to 150 characters, so, you know, two and a half to three times the length. And you can go into more detail. You can talk about... Uh, you know, you know, check out uh, our, well, it's going to be a bad example. I don't even know. Write a sentence that fits the character length that is um, a bit salesy, has some call to action, gives people incentive to click. Uh, don't give them the full out answer to the search. If it's uh, a question like what time zone is Toronto in, don't put the answer to that in the description because people aren't going to click it. Um, you know, keep the description with some call to action in there. Uh, I get alluring. It's, you're supposed to be drawing them into the site. So they click on you instead of the alternatives on the page. Exactly. Yeah. You you want to stand out for sure. Um, you do not have to have a meta description on every page of your site, unlike the title tags. Uh, it is advisable that you have one on the important pages of your site, but you don't have to have them on all of them. Uh, they should be unique. Do not repeat meta descriptions from page to page. And, of course, again, make sure it's relevant. So often you see things that aren't relevant. Or what I see quite often is a single meta description that is a sentence about what the business is, and it's repeated across the entire site. I see that all the time. Don't do that. Um, and, again, don't stuff it. It's not a list of keywords. Google does not look 
at this meta description as a ranking factor. So they are not looking for keywords in there and ranking your site based on those keywords. So that's important to know. So if you stuff it, you're not helping anybody. In fact, you're probably doing yourself a disservice because if you have a ridiculous stuff meta description and people see that in search, are they going to click your listing? Maybe, but maybe not. So what well, also it's an indicator of spam. Google will consider it negatively, but they don't consider positively towards your rankings. So if you have a spam in there, yeah, it's going to have a bad, you're not going to do as well on rankings. So in that aspect, um, or at the very least, you're giving a pretty bad indicator of, of the web page's quality. Uh, and they're going to be uh, watching, looking, perhaps they look at things a little tighter. I don't know, but either way, I would not do it. Exactly. And again, links, um, it is somewhat important, I suppose, but um, if you fit your meta description within the range of, say, 70 to 150 characters, you're more likely to have Google use that meta description. If it's too short, they'll most likely pull content from your site that may or may not be favorable. For the most part, Google's pretty good these days of making their own, but not always. So if you want them to use yours, make sure you're, you're doing a good job with it. Yeah, and that is the unfortunate thing uh, to, to sort of dovetail into what you said there, like Google just, it decides if they're going to use yours or not. And sometimes they do do a poor job of your description. And if you don't include one where you really should have had one, uh, it's your own fault and you never know what they're going to put in. Uh, typically, if they give you a bad description, I would look at the content of your page. It's probably not very clear what it's about. So that, that's another indicator because it's essentially trying to summarize the page. And if it's confused, wow, that's a bad sign. So uh, another thing to keep in mind. So next up is the canonical tags. This is a little, no, this is a lot confusing for a lot of people, but it doesn't have to be. Um, essentially, it's a, it's a tag that's put on the page that is used to tell search engines that which URL, in other words, which page is the main page with of the content that you see when you look at the page. Um, it's primarily used when a page may have duplicates related to product variants, tracking parameters, or other URL versions. Now, this is where it gets, yeah, you, your brain probably shut down at that point. So I'll go back to stating that if you have multiple pieces of content on your site that is identical, but you want to make sure that Google only takes into account one of them. You would make sure that they all use the canonical tag for the page that is the one you want. And it's not something people can see. This is entirely in the code. And it's very handy because uh, it, it, it sort of says this is the original piece of content. This is the one we want you to care about. These other ones don't matter as much. Um, Google can still see those pages, but this is the one that matters. Now, why would you have multiple pieces of content? That is a good question. There are very, very, very few examples that I can think of off the top of my head where it would be a logical thing to do. Um, but the most common issue is when there are different versions of a URL that are accidentally created. Um, this is going to be really hard to describe on a podcast, isn't it, Scott? Um, so essentially, if you're, if you're, web page, when you look at the URL, that's the, the the link that appears in the browser above your uh, tabs. It will show you where, or below your tab, it's going to show you where you are. Um, if that ends with a, a forward slash, and all of a sudden there's another version of your page that has uh, .index.php, but it's actually still the same page. It's just another way of reaching that page. And that actually works quite commonly on servers. Google could technically think those are two different pages and one of them would not be as, as effective because it would be duplicate content, which is not a good thing on your website. But if you have the canonical tag, Google will know, okay, no, no, I'm just going to ignore this one. This is the one he wants, they want us to use. Uh, it's a really rough example. Here's a, I think I've got a good example. So Shopify is a good example for this. So if you create a product page in Shopify, it will typically show up at two distinct URLs. One will be at whatever.com slash product or products slash product name, whatever that is, um, whatever, redwidgets.php, and without the PHP, redwidgets. 
and but it will also show up at whatever.com slash collections slash products slash product name. So there is in one instance you have slash collections showing up in the URL and one you don't. Now Shopify typically by default will canonicalize one to the other. So the slash collections slash product URL string will have the canonical tag that points to the version without slash collections. So if you have a Shopify site and you're like, oh my God, I need to deal with this. Well, you probably don't. It's probably already done. But that's just one example of a, a content management system that will create multiple versions of the exact same page. And I mean exact same. It's just a, a pure copy. It's a mirrored version. And they use that for breadcrumb navigation and, and there are reasons they do it. But the canonical tag is there to prevent things like this from being issues. So that's a, one good example. Um, the other things like tracking, if you're running paid ad campaigns, you'll often put what's called UTM tracking, or you might do other versions of tracking where at the end of a URL, you put question mark, source equals Google and campaign equals this and blah, 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 which creates a duplicate of the exact same page available at two distinct URLs. So that's another example where the canonical tag would uh, eliminate that weird tracking URL and tell Google, we don't care about that one. You look at this other variation. Um, the best part about canonical tags is Google may choose to fully ignore them. So <laughs> nothing is, yeah, nothing is full safe. Um, sometimes you will have one that you definitely want one page to be the canonical URL for whatever reason, and Google will just fight you on it and use a different one. And, um, you know, you might have to start redirecting things and playing around to try to fix that. But anyways, you, you want it in place though, because otherwise you may see Google flag. Well, you might not see it but they may consider a whole bunch of duplicate content on your site, which can potentially cause problems. So yeah, it just devalues the quality of the website. And yeah, you don't want that, right? You want every advantage you possibly can. Okay. Now we're going to jump into the headings on a page. Uh, but actually rewinding a sec, canonical tags, um, it's spelled canon and then I C A L uh, canonical. Check it out online if you want some really great explanations that you can actually see. It's so difficult to explain this on a podcast, and I think it would take you no time at all to do that. And you could always ask an AI, go to ChatGPT and say, what can you simply describe what a canonical tag is? And it will do a phenomenal job at doing it. And if it doesn't, you guys could do it again. Um, and uh, I've actually learned a lot of concepts that I'd always have a hard time understanding by doing that. So it's a really neat usage of AI. All right, uh, headings. These are essentially the vi we're look we're now into the visual. This is what you can see on the page. The heading tags um, are a way to s provide structure to a page. There's heading one, heading two, heading three, heading four, heading five. Typically, you might only use up to heading three. I mean, mostly heading one and heading two, but sometimes heading three. Um, how do you use it when you're doing SEO? Yeah, so generally speaking, the main heading, heading one, that clients always call the title, and then everything gets confusing because then you don't know if they're talking the page title or the heading yeah. one. <laughs> um, the main heading is, you know, that it's a heading. I don't know how else to describe it. It's the big, bold text at the top of the page uh, that needs to be short, you know, two, three, four, five words, something like that. You know, again, it depends. Um, typically it's the biggest, boldest text on the page and you want to very concisely describe what that page is. So if you are putting a, a title on a service page, you might have it, uh, simply read, uh, SEO services or, um, Victoria real estate. And then the you, you just called it a title. <laughs> see, see, that's what I'm saying, right? It's so, it's just like a report. If you had a report, it's going to start with a title. We're talking about visual, right? Well, that's a heading one. Yeah, it's ahead of one. So it's a fair statement. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So not, just ignore me. No, don't do that. Um, so, so you, yeah, you want a keyword in there. The main keyword for the page that you're targeting should be in that heading one and it should be distinct, unique. It should not be a copy of your title tag, which a lot of people will do. A lot of content management systems sometimes do that by default. Whatever you label the page name as automatically goes in the title. It goes in the slug. It goes in the H1. Um, you, don't really want that necessarily. Um, you want it to be unique. And you typically only want one heading one on a page because the heading one describes the core content of that page. If you have two heading ones, that means you have two distinct 
sections of core content that are not the same, uh, which you don't typically want. You can do it. It's not against SEO rules. But if you have more than one heading, one tag, it can dilute things because if, if you have a need to have two heading ones with two distinct chunks of content, while those chunks of content should probably be on their own unique pages, you should probably break them up into separate pages. Um, there are examples out there where you may not want to do that or may not make sense. So if you have to have two or three or five or ten, please don't have ten. But you can do it if you have a reason to do it. It's not Google's not going to slap you, but you might have less chance of ranking. One, I would, I would. It's it's mindset, right? When you're building a page, why would you have more than a heading one? Well, my, why would you have more than one heading one? Because essentially, again, it depends. There are examples where we let it go, but really you're saying that there's more than one main topic on that page. Well, that's going to confuse things. So have one main topic, one title, like one report per, per page instead of having a bunch. If you're going to have subtitles, then perfect. That's no problem. Have heading two because they're all under that same guided topic. Exactly. Yeah. So just really question why you're using a heading one again if you want to do it because you're probably misguided and you need to reconsider. And one thing I'll point out that I, I maybe don't have to, but I, again, I see this all the time, so I'm going to say it. I have seen cases where instead of an H1, heading one tag, people will use, say, a heading five or a heading six because they like the way it looks by default. It's not as big. But these can all be redefined using CSS. So cascading style sheets will allow you to make the heading one look any way you want, any size, any font. Don't use... A smaller heading, H2, H3, H4, because it gives you the look you're going for, because that's going to not have the SEO impact you want. Yeah. So, and then a line set. Yeah. Sorry, when you do that, you're, and you're actually using the code that your designer created or using the, um, uh, design. How do you use the word? Anyway. They've set what the H6 is going to look like. So if you like that, just tell them, okay, I want that in a heading three or I want that in a heading two. Just make them copy it. What Scott said about CSS or cascading style sheets is that's essentially how your site is designed nowadays. So we're just saying that the design can be edited to work and it's not difficult. It is grade one level development. If they say it's going to cost a fortune, there's something wrong. <laughs> this should be so simple. It's close enough that with a, a little editor, you could do it yourself. Don't, <laughs> but you technically could if you just spent a little time. So it's it's not difficult, and I think it's best that you do that. Well, depending on the, the content management system you're using, if it's a one-off, I wouldn't change it. Like if I'm working outside of the guidance of my designer, I wouldn't change it on a site-wide level. But if you're working on a specific page where the, the heading is, you can often just click on it and change the styling of it right there in a lot of uh, 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 editors. Not always, but in a lot, a lot of WordPress ones work like Divi. It's it's really easy. So, yeah. Anyways, might yeah. Make don't your developer uh, a little cranky, but yes, might it might absolutely it might break dynamic aspects for mobile. Could do all kinds of things, but um, yeah. Don't use the wrong heading because you like the way it looks. Mm -hmm. You can fix it. There, there's a lot of words to say that. Okay, we're gonna take a quick break, and we come back. We're gonna talk about body text, media, navigation, and so on. SEO 101 will be back right after recess. Welcome back to SEO 101 on WMR.FM, hosted by myself, Ross Dunn, CEO of Stepforth Web Marketing, and my company senior SEO, Scott Zanak. Today, we're on Chapter 3 of the SEO 101 Learning Series, and we're talking about optimization of your page. So, we're now into the body text. This is what, again, we talked about before. This is the visual. So, this is the content that people can see when they get to the page, and this is the meat of it all. Uh, there's some very basic stuff to consider there. First of all, uh, this is pretty much consistent across everything we've said. Don't stuff keywords. Don't put keywords in just for the sake of them being there if they're not going to have any benefit to the page or they look like you're just catering to search engines. The page should be written naturally for readers to offer the best benefit. Google is highly vigilant about pages that have been designed only to make it happy. It, it wants to make sure users are happy and it's providing the best experience for users. And their their algorithms, all this work they're doing is essentially in that 
mindset and that they're going for that goal. So don't work against them. Make sure your content is excellent. It's written for people first, search engines, a distant second. Okay. Um, it's, it's going to pay huge dividends. The other thing is length. How long should content be on a web, on a web page? Well, it, it, it's always, and it depends, I guess, but really this succinctly put is how much do you need to answer the question that the page is supposed to be providing an answer to, right? So make sure that the content answers the question well or provides the content the way it would be, if, you know, like the way you'd want to read it. So that if you get to the page and go, this answers the question immensely, it's perfect, it's exactly what I was looking for, congratulations, you've done it. If that means it's only going to be 250 words, it's unlikely, but if that's the case, okay. We would probably go in as SEOs and go, oh, can you make that a little longer? But let's say 400 words, if we were trying to throw a number out there, which is ideal. The fact of the matter is, it it is all about the quality. Um, and if it requires writing a 2,000 words or 5,000 words on a page, then do it. Um, I would supplement it with different types of content as well, such as media, uh, images, video, sound files even. Who knows? I mean, all this stuff can be built in. Um, and it adds more dexterity to the page, more quality. And that's stuff that Google loves to see. And frankly, we do. Because again, Google's trying to cater to what we want to see. So that's what it likes to see too. Uh, and one of the, the examples I thought uh, you put down here, which I like is if you're, cons- if you're wondering what kind of content is excelling, just look at the top 10 of the, the results. Although there's no top 10 anymore, I guess, but look at the first 10 results you see, um, in search and look at what's showing up. If there's something there that you like, that you can emulate, go for it. Not copy, but emulate. And like, oh, that's a good idea. They put a chart in there or they put in a timeline or whatever it might be. Great. Maybe that's something you add to yours to add complexity and, and quality to the page. Uh, oftentimes, you'll find that a lot of them are lacking, but they're still ranking. That's kind of an ideal situation because then you go, woohoo, I'm set to succeed. If I create an amazing article here with that timeline with all of these different things. How can I lose? You just don't be expecting immediate results. It does take time. And you may even need to put the word out, uh, word out about that page, uh, telling people, Hey, check this out. I think this is a really good, um, and a proof example of this. And people in your, your peers will go, wow. Yes. Very likely, right? If you've done an amazing job and, uh, whether that'll lead to more links or who know, or what and who knows, but it's at least getting the word out. Uh, now, Scott, why are you talking about some uh, the different types of linking that you can do on a page? Yeah, so one thing you want to make sure you do in most cases with your content is have what I call and most people call inline linking. So what an inline link essentially is, is a link found within a body of text. It might be, you know, a couple keywords or, or, or linked within the actual paragraph as opposed to your main site navigation. Um, and so you want to include this inline linking in your content where it makes sense to do so. You don't want to put in a hundred links in your content, but you might want two or three or maybe five where it makes sense. So a good example might be if you have a blog post about one of your services or one of your products and you're going into detail about that product or service, well, you want to make sure you have some links within that content that point back to your main service page or your main product page. It could be as simple as, um, uh, you know, buy this thing over here and, you know, you link to the page encourage people to buy or for more information about our product or for more information about our plumbing services, check out our residential plumbing page or that sort of thing. You want to direct people to your money pages, essentially, but also other relevant content. So if you've got a page that is a good uh, supplement to another page on your site, so you've got two blog posts that are talking about similar but different topics, you might want to cross link the two of those through links within the content. Uh, you really, it's about, it used to be about link every single anchor that is your target keyword to the page you want to rank and it would work. But now it's more about thinking of your users. If they're reading your content and there's an opportunity to put a link to something to support what you're talking about, you want to do that. And I, we had an SEO con- contract a couple of years ago and I remember he had all over the place 
this client had text where it just said, oh, for more information about this, search our page for blah, 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 but with no link. So they're, they're making you, you know, telling you find the search page, go to the search page, do a search for this, and then you'll find it. Like, why don't you put in the link? Like, so if you, if, if you're doing that, don't again, link to the page directly, make it easy, but. Um, and again, you know, don't overstuff it unless it really makes sense to have 50 links. Don't have 50 links. So I can't think of an example where it would, but you know, a really lengthy blog post or tutorial type post, it might warrant it. Um, and don't be afraid of external links either. So those are links that point to other websites. I would not typically link to my direct competitor, but I might link. You know, if I sell cars, I might link to an auto parts website that sells parts for those cars if you don't sell the parts, things like that. Yeah, Relevant it's being proven that it has any benefit, but if it's adding value to the page for people, that's what you want to do. Exactly. And I don't know. I kind of think Google looks at that and maybe it does have some benefit. It hasn't been proven, but maybe. But again, it, it's all about users first, making a site useful for your users. That's what you want to do. So if it involves a link to another website, do it. I mean... Don't make people leave your site to search when they can open it a new tab and your site stays open or something, you know. So, yeah, and uh, you were mentioning about having too many links on the page and such, and and that's that's really important. You just rewind a little bit, everyone. That again, you're writing for people, not for search. So don't overthink and start adding text links or links on your page just because you you're worried there isn't one. If there's not a valid reason for it, then don't do it. Um, at the end of the article, you could always say, or, or page, you could say, uh, for more information, or if you want to read more on this subject that, and to need greater detail, uh, here's a, a relevant article, and you can link to that. Now, part of the, the benefits of inline linking is it's actually a bit of a science unto itself uh, in, in SEO, uh, because it's it's what creates uh, focus within your site. If all one, let's say five pages of your 300 page website are, are mostly linked to from other pages because they're so well written and they're so detailed. Those are what you might consider calling cornerstone, corner, cornerstone content. Now this is, you know, Google's going to look at your site, see all these links pointing to them and they're going to put those on a pedestal. Uh, they're going to say, all right, on your site, you obviously think these are very important pages. So, uh, they better be good, first of all. Yeah. But if they're, if they are good, then they're more likely to rank than the other pages. So hopefully that's connecting some dots for you because that's part of optimization. It's ensuring that content that is important to you has that kind of pedestal and has a focus on it via links within the site and quality. Uh, it's yeah, it's one of the core principles of SEO is ensuring that. And if you have a new page you add that you think this is going to be great, this is a total cornerstone content. Well, I think think about your site and how it's built and go, hmm, how am I going to make sure that there's enough length point of this internally so that Google understands this is new cornerstone content? And that'll involve going back through the site perhaps and finding relevant. Focused, I'm focused on this work. Relevant opportunities to link to it. Again, don't do this just for search. You're doing it for users, but you are literally making it easier for them to find better content. Uh, and maybe as you've added a new service or a new product line, or perhaps you finally answered those questions they're always asking. Yeah, it's, I love that. It's so logical, right? It's just the best part about SEO. It is logical. You're making it easy for them to find content and, and Google likes that. And they're going to make it show better if it's great and worthwhile. Uh, there are aspects we'll get into later uh, that stack on top of that to make it more likely for that page to rank. But uh, that's the principle in effect. Now, what about navigation, Scott? Yeah, so with navigation, <laughs> this seems really weird to say this out loud because it's not really something we've looked at in a long time or seen much of. But use text-based navigation for your primary navigation. And what that means is don't use an image that links to the next page, an image that's hyperlinked, which used to be re when we first started out, or at least when I did, started out with SEO 20 years ago, it was incredibly common in websites to use images 
for headings rather than actual text. So um, I don't know how I can explain image versus what text is, because that's a question that I used to get. But the, the button or the image may have text embedded as part of the button or image, but there's no way to select the text. So Google looks at text within links, but not if it's as part of a, an image or a button. Um, not many people do this anymore. I do still see it sometimes, but it's pretty rare these days because you can make text look like an image using Cascade. We're using CSS. So and that's typically what is done, and that's how it should be done because Google looks at the text, and those words in the link influence SEO. So that's enough about images there, but just don't do that. The same goes for headings, actually. Sometimes you'll see images being used for headings. Um, yeah, I should have brought that up earlier. And I, actually, I see that quite a bit still. Uh, don't do that either. So if, if you need to put text on your website and you're thinking about putting it inside an image, you're better off rethinking how you're displaying that information. Just had a flashback to, to uh, menu items that were images with, that were image GIFs with like flames. <laughs> oh, yeah. And they're animated. <laughs> animated when you hover over them and stuff. Oh, yeah. Oh, those were fun sites. We have fun. some. <laughs> and they're, they're, they would they would animate and then play an audio clip something oh, or sure. MIDI or something. <laughs> oh man, that's the best! It scares the crap out of you. If you get your volume on and you hover <laughs> over a link and your computer screams at you or something. Yeah, I, I don't miss it, but I kind of do. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I don't want to miss. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, we were talking a bit about how many links on a page uh, in your primary navigation. You know, try to keep it below a hundred links. Uh, there used to be kind of a hard, fast rule that actually, I think, if I remember correctly, it used to be that Google just wouldn't crawl anything over 100 links. Yeah. Um, if you had more, if you had 101, that 101st link. On the whole page. Keyboard. Yeah, yeah, on the whole page, everything. Not the case anymore. Google will crawl everything eventually. But, you know, as a general rule of thumb, you don't want 1,000 links, 2,000 links. And I've seen stuff like that, too, where the drop downs get out of control with product links. Uh, you don't want to do that. Think of each page as having a vote. And that one vote is divided up equally into the number of links on that page. So if you have one page with one link, that one link is getting a whole vote. If you have 100 links, each one is getting 1% of a vote. So, you know, that's kind of a, a loose way of looking at it anyway. So you really want to limit the number of links to those that are the most important. That could be core product pages, core service pages, um, anything that's the most important for your users. So definitely consider that if you, if it gets out of control in your nav, refine it a little bit, keep it to top level category pages. Maybe don't include product pages in your navigation. If you have thousands of products, if you only have a few, sure. Um, yeah, if it looks like too many, it's too many. Uh, another thing I see sometimes, and so this actually goes back to the canonical tag, ensure that your homepage links point to the exact homepage URL. So, Instead of going to uh, stepforth.com slash index.php, which will probably work, go to stepforth.com forward slash. Uh, if you start using, are you going to check it? I am. I, I'm actually curious. I think we're it does redirect work, yeah. it. It redirects. Yeah. It did redirect. So that's good. You should have other variations redirect. Um, in old school hand coded pages, there were a lot of different URL strings that would load correctly load your homepage. Um, default.html, index.html would both work, even if those files didn't physically exist. So it's kind of an old problem that you don't see a lot of anymore because most content management systems just fix it by default, like WordPress redirects it as it should. So it may not be an issue, but make sure to check it. I do, I see it. I see it often still enough that it's worth mentioning. Okay. The next part is, um, I don't actually where, know where we would fit this, but we're talking about navigation. And I mean fit it in terms of this entire course, but um, all of this brought up one concept, and that is uh, what we called theming back when we thought we invented it in-house, but essentially uh, it's now become more widely known as siloing. So when you're web building your website, you want it to have very clear sections and those sections are 100% focused. So uh, for the example I always use, and I've really got to get a better one, is a car dealership. So uh, let's say someone's looking for a new car. They come to your site. They want a BMW. Well, they're going to look at the, the, the header navigation, and they're going to see that 
there's a link to BMW. And then when they highlight over that, maybe there's some sublinks. If not, fine, they can just click on it. There's another one for Mercedes. There's another one for uh, Audi, whatever. When they click on BMW, though, they go to a section of the site that is devoted to BMW. So when you think about silos in the real world, you'll see like a uh, a wheat silo or corn silo. Uh, you know, these are different places on a farm. Those are all wheat. Those are all corn. You know, there there there's no mix. <laughs> Be very bad to mix. So it <laughs> the same concept here. It's not. Horrible to mix a little bit, like you could link to other ones if you want more information on Mercedes as the same issue as this BMW. Well, that's fine. But the point here is that these are subject matter intensive and focused on BMW. The other one is for Mercedes. And the beauty of this is when Google goes in there and it goes into the BMW section, it's so utterly clear what that area should rank for. Um there's a lot more that goes into it, which we've already we're, we're discussing today, uh, in terms of optimizing pages and stuff. But by you're setting yourself up for better results if you build your site with this kind of a focused structure uh, of silos. So do keep that in mind. It puts you in a place where you make less mistakes that we try to muddle through and explain. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's that's pretty important stuff. Now. Structured markup. This stuff is not the most, this is probably the more difficult stuff for us to explain on a podcast. Uh, and I can see why, you know, we've put in some definitions here. I believe you put these in, Scott. So what is. is schema markup? According to Babel, they'll, uh, no, yeah, I'm doing it. <laughs> okay, you do it. I, 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 typically that's where you would say, what is schema markup? Scott, what is it? I didn't say Scott though, did I? No, you didn't. I'm sorry. (laughs) Um, Structured data is a standardized format for providing information about a page and classifying the page content. For example, on a recipe page, what are the ingredients? The cooking time and temperature, the calories, and so on. Unquote. So when you're looking at a recipe page, you're going and you're seeing ingredients. Well, you're telling Google these are ingredients. They're looking at the cooking time. Well, they're saying this is cooking time and it's in Fahrenheit. Um, these, these are, these numbers we're putting in are calories. It's a way of really absolutely smacking Google in the face with this is exactly what this is about. Don't guess otherwise. <laughs> and that's the beauty of it. That's what I love about structured markup. You're taking away some of the guessing that Google has to do. So you have more control over what it sees and understands when it's on the site. Should say what it understands. That's these. So um, I'll leave it now to Scott. Why use it? Other okay. Than- so yeah, in a nutshell, structured data can help search engines fully understand your content, uh, which often results in upgrades in search results. So you might see rich results. Recipes are another great example. If someone's looking for a pulled pork recipe, you will see snippets of recipes in search results, and sometimes those get there because someone's used structured markup. Um, so it's it's really good for ranking from that perspective for getting those rich results and little bonuses in search and helping Google fully understand what your site is and why it should rank. So I, I can't think of maybe any reasons why you wouldn't use it to some degree. Uh, some websites you need it a lot more than others, but most should, if not all, should have it. So okay. I will. One thing I want to mention um, is that even if it's a small site, you might think, oh, whatever, I don't need this. And you're probably not wrong. It may not be a huge impact for you. But consider this. Google needs to understand what you're talking about. If it has to guess, it might be wrong. It's pretty good, but it may be wrong. And these days, AI, what is running generative AI, what we see when we get answers, is driven by this information. So by having schema on your site, you're providing Google with more knowledge, more context, so that it can possibly use your content in, in generative AI. It's not for sure, but you are definitely opening the door to it at a greater to a to a greater width. <laughs> it's open wider. <laughs> there you go. I floor opener, but please jump in now. 
Yeah, yeah. So I want to, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about this because this is a technical level, but it's maybe there are terms you should be aware of. So there are three main types of schema that people generally use for their structured markup. One is JSON LD. Uh, this is by far the easiest method and the most recommended method for marking content up. It is a code that looks, I, I don't want to say it looks like JavaScript. It is JavaScript, but it doesn't look like JavaScript you might have seen before. It's a very human readable. It's very easy for someone who has no coding experience to edit. There are some intricacies where it can get difficult, but generally speaking, it's very easy to work with. And, and that's what you should be using. Most systems use it. Uh, it's rare that I see markup done any other way these days. Even Google recommends it, but does not require it. Uh, the other formats are microdata. Uh, microdata adds HTML tags to each individual property you want to mark up. So with JSON-LD, you'll have a block of code, and that block of code will have everything in that block in one tidy, tidy little spot, and it's perfect. With and it microdata, describes everything on the page, right? It describes everything. It's like yeah. almost like a page in itself in a sense, but really concise, basic, easy to read by bots, easy to read by humans, easy to code, easy, easy, easy. Microdata adds a little extra tags throughout the page wherever you want to mark up little bits and pieces of information. So if you have your phone number and you want to mark that up as a phone number, it might be marked up in you know the top of your code, and then your address might be in a different part, and then your you know it can be messy, difficult to manage. Um, it, it's really complicated to implement, and I don't know maybe more than two or three times I've ever actually used it intentionally, and that would have been in the early days where. You know, it was it was just kind of new. We were playing around mm -hmm. with it, but don't use it. Well, you can, but <laughs> you probably don't want to. If you're not technical, don't touch it. Much and little for punishment, don't use it. <laughs> exactly. And then there's also RDF, which stands for Resource Description Framework. And I promise I... Okay, I had to look it up. Uh, and it is very similar to microdata in that it is complicated and it, it's all over the place, but it adds another level of complexity to it. And I've never worked with it and... I can't even think of a specific example why you would want to, but again, if you want to go in that route, you can use it, but don't look to me for support. Yeah, <laughs> it's actually the first thing I learned. Uh, oh, you did? No, I don't remember it. I, I, I remember re just resource description framework, and I remember that was the only way I into schema when I first learned. Um, weird, huh? Anyway, uh, it has definitely been a long time, and I've never practiced it since, so it's seared and I've gone poof. You're not gonna. We're not gonna do a section in depth into RDM right now. Oh no, man, that that could be fun. That could be on a blooper reel. Wow. Um. <laughs> anyways, I'll give you some examples of things you might want to mark up. There, schema can almost be a show or a few shows in itself, really. Mm -hmm. uh, but a lot of it's quite technical, so maybe that maybe they shouldn't be. But anyways, uh, you should use appropriate schema markup for things you want to mark up. It sounds obvious, but anyways. Uh, the most, <laughs> I'm gonna stop talking. <laughs> um, the, the, the most obvious is things, uh, is your business information. So organization is really common. Or if you're a local business, use local business. Um, local business is growing. So what we used to do is we would just flag any local business as local business. And then you put your contact information, your hours, your, all the things would be marked up in JSON-LD as type equals local business. But now you can get really um, granular with that. You can list it as a dentist, as a, mm -hmm. uh, a real estate, as a plumber, as there are hundreds of, of subcategories of local business that you would choose to mark up. It's still local business, but you're being specific in what you're telling Google. Um, there is a link I listed. It'll be in the notes. It's a big, long link. I'm not going to try to read it out here. That gives you a full rundown of all the possibilities. So if you're not included, if you author, operate a local business that's not like SEO isn't one, I don't think, um, I should check that. <laughs> then just use local business. And yeah, you'll mark up all kinds of things in there. It's typically will be all your contact information, your hours, uh, your address, your uh, uh, longitude, latitude coordinates, a link to Google Maps, a same as, so same as would point to other things that you um, are part of it might be if you're on Wikipedia, good for you. You include that. It would point to your social media account. It's just there are lots of things you can mark up there. Uh, other things you might want to mark up. Other types of schemas include uh, articles, people, which we talked about a bit earlier. 
a video object, products, events, reviews, uh, recipes. There's a long, long list of things that you can do there. So just make sure that you consider it for sure. Um, wow, that was a bad sentence I just said. Anyways. <laughs> Um, and Ross wants to jump in and say something here too. Yeah, sorry, I just made a note there. So all of this is really important because what we talked about, it makes things really clear for Google. But, you know, we talked about same as. The same as is a way to say that. And we, this is, this dies in directly into that author page, that bio page where you're like, um, uh, maybe you've got an article on Forbes or an article on Fortune magazine or whatever it might be. And you want to associate yourself with that or make sure that no one else can say it. Another Ross Dunn could say that this is their content. I would say, this is me by doing a same as. This is the stage. Um, maybe it's another same as pointing to another bio on a page at Karma on another site you write for. Maybe it's a same as to a, a article on a newspaper talking about this great thing you did, whatever it might be. Now, all of this adds up to improving Google's knowledge base, its knowledge graph, its understanding of who you are and what you are and what your expertise is, um, which is actually a service that we offer um, to ensure that this is very clear. Now, um, what? why would this really be important? Well, again, it's about ensuring your authority is in- unquestionable. So in my case, I'm actually, hopefully by the time you test this, uh, if you listen to this soon after we launch it, then it will not be the case. But if you listen to this a month or two down the line, uh, the line or maybe next year, right now it's it's October 2023, uh, maybe a few months down the line, you'll see this. So if you type in Ross Dunn or Ross Dunn SEO, you should see very clearly that it's about me. There's a, a nice knowledge graph of my picture and all the information about me. Because that's what we're working on right now for my uh, personal uh, profile. All of that can be influenced using schema. It's just how it's done. And it is a lot of work when you get into this kind of a professional level of creating and improving knowledge panels, but it is totally doable. So um, I get excited about this stuff because it's personally what I'm learning right now. In fact, I'm jumping into a course to further my knowledge on this just after this podcast. It's very cool. It's, it's everything that is coming for AI. I mean, it's been around a long time, but now it's really being applied. And that's typically how Google works. It puts out new stuff all the time with a longer goal in mind. And it takes a long time for it to start to use it because it needs to work out of the bugs and work out all the spam and all that stuff. But this is very important to Google's understanding of how the entire world works uh, from its... Um, and I speak to Google as the entity almost <laughs> that really understands the web and provides the results uh, because it's also the entity that's going to be providing artificial intelligence and answers. And we're going to see more and more of that as it gets to the point that it can do a great job of it. And it's based on the knowledge base on this uh, knowledge graph. So uh, I know that's a lofty thing to throw in there, but it is very fascinating and it is going to be a part of your world, um, even as a small business. It's going to be important to establish your authority. And uh, that's why we're taking this on intensely and making it a big part of what we do. So if you want more information on that, you know how to reach me. Um, uh, Roth at stepforth.com is my email. And uh, I'd love to talk more about it. By that point, I'm sure we'll have this well rolled out to all of our clients. And uh, maybe we can help you as well. It's fascinating. And, and I think you'll like it as well. Scott was about to mention a few things. I'll just rattle them off. You can see code examples of what schema looks like by going to schema.org. That's spelled S-C-H-E-M-A dot org. Schema dot org. Um, you can validate your code as well. You can just say validate schema. Just type that in Google and you'll find different ways of doing it. We recommend validator dot schema dot org or Google's rich results testing, which is search.google.com slash test slash Rich hyphen results. Uh, just rewind if you want to hear that again. Um, it's really handy. It's a huge component of everything that is coming in the future. So I can't emphasize it enough, even though we can't fully get into it. So showing you how to do it is akin to like uh, having a mechanics podcast trying to tell you how to fix your engine. It's just... Uh, 
It's a little, little much. <laughs> so how, how, do, how do I do the nymph this book? Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that is the end of Chapter 3 of the SEO 101 Learning Series. In Chapter 4, we're going to get into local SEO. And uh, it's going to be really interesting for all of you with uh, brick-and-mortar shops or service area businesses. Uh, we're really looking forward to, to walking you through that. Well, on behalf of myself, Ross Dunn, CEO of Step Forth Web Marketing, and my company senior SEO, Scott Fennack, thank you for joining us today. Remember, we have a show notes newsletter you can sign up for at seo101radio.com, where you'll get the notes from this uh, tutorial and other ones, and uh, it's just a handy way to, to catch up. If you have any questions, you can also share with us on our Facebook group, easily found by searching SEO 101 Podcast on Facebook. Have a great week, and remember to tune into future episodes, which air twice a month on WMR.FM. Also, thank you for listening, everybody. The opinions expressed on this program are those of the guests and hosts and do not necessarily reflect those of WebmasterRadio.fm's management or sponsors. Any rebroadcast or redistribution without authorized consent of WebmasterRadio.fm is prohibited.